Well, that's good. Um, a welcome again. It's lovely to see so many family members and friends and stuff that have come to support those who are getting baptised. We'll get to that in just a bit, but we're going to spend a few minutes just thinking through uh, some of the stuff that we just read from that little reading in Galatians chapter 3. Before we do that, let's commit our time to the Lord. Let's ask for his help. Father, we pray for our children as they leave. We pray for those who are teaching them. Uh, Lord, that the things that they learn, that their young hearts will receive those truths, uh, that their thinking will be shaped in accordance with the truth of your word. And Father, we ask for ourselves too, as, as we look into your word now together, that you would speak to each one of us and show us wonderful truths. Show us a bit more of what Jesus is like, that we might trust him better and love him more. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, well, if you've got a Bible in front of you, Galatians 3 is where we are, and we're just looking at a few of those verses. But, but to get us going this morning, let me just ask you a question. What actually is a Christian? What actually is a Christian? I wonder how you'd answer that question if somebody asked that of you. What defines a Christian? Now, I guess a lot of people, certainly people I've encountered, would, would say it has to do with some, some kind of following of a religion, uh, following its teachings, its commands, traditions, and rituals, or that it's to do with believing a set of propositions. Yeah? Things like there is a God, uh, that Jesus is his son, that we're to obey and follow his teachings. So, you know, those are, those are interesting ways of thinking about what a Christian is. I, um, because I now live in the 21st century, I decided I would ask ChatGPT. So ChatGPT, as far as I can understand, it seems to be the pooling of the intelligence or ignorance of, of the globe uh, in, in artificial intelligence. This is, so I asked ChatGPT to define what, a, what is a Christian in 50 words. Uh, this is what ChatGPT told me. A Christian is someone who follows Jesus Christ, believes in his divini divinity, death, and resurrection for salvation, and lives according to his teachings. This involves faith in Christ, reading the Bible, participating in church, and striving to embody love, compassion, and righteousness in daily life. It's not bad, is it? <laughs> it's, it's pretty good, isn't it, for a computer? But actually, all of these definitions, you see, they really do seem to focus on the things Christians do rather than what a Christian actually is, who they are. And what we just read in that Bible passage earlier, from a letter written to the churches in an area called Galatia, in, in southern Turkey, uh, and, and what I want us to have a, a closer look at is, I think, I think gets really to the heart of what a Christian is. And we're going to look particularly at verses 26 to 29. They'll pop up on the screen if you haven't got a Bible in front of you. But here, the Apostle Paul, writing to these churches describes the Christian believer in at least, I think, three ways here that I want us to just spend some time thinking about this morning. Uh, and they are this, that Christians are sons of God, that Christians are clothed with Christ, and that Christians are united together in him. Those are the three things that, that, we're, that we're, we're going to go with. Let me just read those verses out. Verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Notice that little link between our morning series about Abraham? That's good, isn't it? We'll, look at the, we'll think about that just for a, in a minute. Christians then, first of all here in these verses, they are sons of God. Now, it's pretty plain in verse 26 that that point's being made. Verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this little statement needs a couple of qualifiers that I'd like to give you before, before we get into it. The first is, there's a, there's a big difference between capital S, Son of God, a title that's given to Jesus alone, 
and the small s, sons of God, that we have here in this verse. Jesus, and, and Jesus is, is the one we're here to worship, he is unique. The Bible describes him, it's interesting this, as being the firstborn of all creation. That's an interesting title to give, isn't it? So as son, capital S, son of God, he's the firstborn. Uh, but Jesus was not created. He himself is the creator. And he is before all things, and it's by him that everything was made. He's the son of God. So, so here's the interesting thing here then. The title firstborn does not mean he was born first, okay? Uh, because God is outside of time. Birth, birth, birth would, 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 would need a beginning, wouldn't it? It would need time. And now, interestingly, in the culture of the day, this was a far richer title than just talking about when you were born and the order that the family was born in. It carried the idea of being most significant or important. So you can picture... Dad with, his, with, 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 with a grown man next to him saying, this one here, this is my firstborn. He does not really care about when he was born or the fact that he was born first. He's talking about him as being, you know, this is my man here. This is the important one. This is the one who will inherit. inherit. It's the son who is preeminent amongst all the sons. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating playing favourites with your children, okay? But this is what's in the title. We are called, Jesus is the Son, but we are called sons of God. Jesus, God the Son. So that's the first thing. The second thing, really, is there's a sense in which you could say, as some do, that actually all, all human beings, they're God's children, right? But only in a very narrow sense, what, what the Bible means when it talks about us being God's offspring is that actually all of us as human beings are made in his image. He's, he's, the, he's the originator, the creator of us all. So in that sense, yes, we're his offspring. But that is not the sense of sonship that we have here in this verse. Here it is, again, much more meaningful and wonderful. Christians are those who have been adopted into God's family. Yeah, this idea of adoption. We, we have an adopted child. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's one of the most wonderful things you can do, I think. Adopted. Adoption means chosen and brought in, doesn't it? Chosen and brought into the family by God. Not just a, a created being, but chosen and brought into God's family. And as this verse says, if you look at it, that happens by faith. That is, it happens when we put our trust in Jesus. It's then that he brings us into God's family so that we are part of, of God's household. We are welcomed because of what Jesus has done for us to have a seat at the table with God as our Father. That's what a Christian is, right? Sons of God. In a sense, also, the Bible can speak of us as being Jesus' brothers. Like he's, our, he's our big brother. It's an amazing idea, isn't it? And so having qualified those two points then, let me just say, please don't be offended that you're being called a son here, especially if you're, especially if you're a female, all right. Some Bible versions, and actually the one that we had read to us earlier, but not the one on the screen, in an attempt to be more politically correct, have substituted the word children here, children of God. And whilst the intention is good, and actually quite often when they do that, it's for a good reason. It actually is right to think of us that way. But actually, in this particular verse, that's not very helpful. Let me explain why. The author is being specific when he talks about Christians being sons of God. You see, in most ancient cultures, like, like the one in Galatia, daughters could not be legal heirs. They would not expect to inherit from their father. And so this description of us all as being sons is actually, to the people it's being written to, is radical. It's an amazing thing to be told. All of us are sons. All of us are heirs in Christ. Imagine being told that as the daughter of the family who's not going to inherit anything from your earthly father. And we said, ah, but you have a heavenly father that you are a son of and you will inherit. <laughs> right? So no matter who we are, simply by faith, we're adopted in and heirs to inherit. So ladies, 
you need to embrace your sonship. And you need to do that in the same way that the gents here have to embrace the fact that they are the bride of Christ. Okay? <laughs> These are pictures we've both got to deal with, but they're beautiful pictures. They're so rich. Now, what is that inheritance then? So, great, I'm going to inherit, I'm a son, but what is the inheritance? Well, verse 29 talks about it a little bit. Uh, and if you, it, what it's saying there is that, have a look at the verse, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's an interesting sentence. But what does it mean? Well, if you've been coming recently on Sunday mornings, you'll be familiar with the fact that God made promises to this man Abraham in the book of Genesis. Promises that he would be greatly blessed. He would have the blessing of God on him. That he would, he would grow to be a multitude, a, a colourful, vibrant multitude of people. And he would have an everlasting home. That's an amazing thing. These are the promises of God. And that is our, as children of God, our certain hope as Christians. So the first thing then that the Christian is, is an adopted son of God in his forever family. And the second one, in verse 27, is that Christians are those who are clothed with Christ. That's a very interesting description of a Christian. Have a look at verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you were baptized into Christ and have, uh, have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, one of the wonderful truths about baptism is that it points us to the amazing truth about our union with Jesus Christ, to be united with him. We're going to think a little bit more about what that means before we have the baptisms this morning. But being in Christ is probably the most common way that the New Testament part of the Bible actually describes Christians. Letters in the Bible are written to those who are in Christ, right? It's a little bit like what we say happens in marriage. Yeah, you've been to marriage. I'm sure most people here have been to marriages where two become one. That's how we talk, isn't it? We, they're united. And likewise, Jesus unites himself to his church, to his people, to become, in a spiritual sense, one with them, united. There's a union between Christians and the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas we could think about it another way, this is a little bit rough and ropey, this is an illustration, but later on today, as we have been made aware again, England will be playing in the European Cup. They've got to the final, it's, it's phenomenal. They're, now, they are a pretty decent team, okay? And mostly because you and I are not playing for them, right? That would kind of bring things down, wouldn't it? And yet, here's the point. If they win tonight, we will have no problem. What we will say is, we won. Won't we? That's what we'll say. We won't say, they won. We'll say, we won. Have you thought about that? It's an interesting way of talking. They play on behalf of the collective nation of England. And so we say, we won. Likewise, in a sense, Jesus is our representative. But in a far more profound sense, he actually takes us with him when he goes to the cross. As Jesus goes to the cross and dies there as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, he takes those united with him, with him to the cross, in a sense. That's a strong way of putting it, isn't it? United to him by faith, in that very act, as Jesus hangs on the cross. But actually, is that, is that, is that am I making that up? No, you can flick a page back to Galatians chapter 2. Let me pop it up on the screen, or you can look at it, turn it up. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. That's not the only place it says this in the New Testament. Listen, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a profound statement. I have been crucified with Christ because I'm united with him. And so here in chapter 3 then, Actually, what you've got is, is Paul going a little bit further here and, and talking about what that, that life that rises from the dead in Christ, what does that look like? Well, his description of it is being clothed with Christ. 
That's a good description. Why? Well, uh, let me give you three thoughts about what that means, to be clothed with Christ. First of all, clothing is an expression of identity. I'm pretty sure that those living in, in the first century Galatia, or in the Roman world anywhere, would recognize uniforms. They'd recognize the uniform of a Roman soldier, a city magistrate, They'd be able to tell apart a a magistrate or a farmer or a shepherd simply by the clothes they wore. In fact, even the cultures that people had come from to the city. Oh, you'd know, oh, they've come from out east somewhere. Oh, that's, that's definitely a Jewish person there. Clothes distinguished people's gender, ethnicity, and religious leanings. And, and, in, and they still do today, don't they? You know, you walk around town, you can tell some of these things. And so I think it, to, to say that we are clothed in Christ, and this is profound, is to say that actually our ultimate identity is found in him before it is found in anything else about us. That's, that's the identity that trumps all identities. I am in Christ, I'm clothed with Christ. His identity. Second thing then, so it's an expression of identity. It's also, clothing is is something that is close to us. You thought about that? It goes wherever we go. It clings to us. And and likewise, Jesus is always with his people, where they are clothed with him. And so being clothed with Christ speaks of that constant, close relationship with him as we live our lives each day. He promised never to leave nor to forsake his disciples. No matter where we are or what we're doing, He's only ever a prayer away. He's close. He's close with us through the ups and downs of life. The third thing, then, is that clothing covers. Clothing covers us. It hides our nakedness. It hides our shame. So rather than having my my weakness and my shamefulness on display, we are instead wrapped in the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thought too, isn't it? Because we are united with Christ and clothed with him, in a sense, then when God looks at us, he he, he sees us wrapped in that righteousness. He sees us in the clothes of his son. He sees his son. You know, the the reformer Martin Luther, uh, he was a mixed bag. Uh, He he drew a, a very strange and memorable parallel between this idea and the story of Jacob and Esau in the book of Genesis. Maybe you know that story. It's a very murky story, but it's an interesting parallel. You see, in the story, Esau is supposed to be the firstborn, right? Supposedly, he should have inherited the birthright from his father, Isaac. But instead, whilst Esau is out hunting... His younger brother, Jacob, knowing his father is mostly blind now and can't tell much between them, dresses himself up in Esau's clothing. So he's dressed in his older brother's clothing. And he comes in and he approaches his father to receive a blessing. And his father can only see and feel what appears to him to be Esau. Even the smell of Esau is on his clothes And likewise then, says Luther, God looks on us. And though he is not deceived, (laughs) that's that's really the, 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 the kink in the story, isn't it? Though he is not deceived, he discerns the appearance and the aroma on the clothes of his son that he willingly gave to us. And this then is the new life that we have been raised with. If you're a Christian here this morning, hear this. It's the life of one who has been clothed with Christ. We are sons of God. We are wrapped in the perfection of the firstborn son. Amazing. And finally then, here in these short verses, we see that Christians also are those who are united in Christ. Okay? Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So not just united to Christ in that mysterious way in which we go to the cross with him, but also united in him together as his people. 
That's an amazing sentence, actually, that. Imagine how shocking that sentence would have been to those who first heard it. There's, you know, the Galatians world was a world where people knew their place in the order of things. Yeah? To be a Roman citizen, that was to be right up on the top of the pile, really. You had so many privileges. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you'd have slaves who'd be maybe captured in war or imported in. Uh, and they were right down. Then the spectrum between those two groups of people would be dramatic, yet not in the church. Consider the contrast in, in the contrast that we've got here. Three contrasts in verse 28 there. The first one, Jews and Greeks. Jews and Greeks did not typically mix very much. They might have had a few business dealings together, but they wouldn't eat together. They make a point of not going into each other's houses, into each other's homes. The Jewish community tended to keep themselves into a little ghetto in most Roman cities, away from the defiling influence of the Greeks. They're not going to go anywhere near one of their temples or anything to do with the Greeks. And then look at the other contrast there, you know, slave and free. Slaves have no control over their destiny. Their lives might have been dreadful, they might have been okay, but they had no control of where, what they were going to do in life. They were considered property. Can you imagine that? You could be mistreated by your master or your mistress, and there's no court you can go to to appeal. You're a piece of their property. They can do with you what they like. But slave and free, come into the church. God, that division's gone. And then consider men, male and female here. This is topical, isn't it? You know, Rome was a very, you know, I've read several historic sources this week, and they describe it as being a macho and misogynistic society, ancient Rome, where women did not have, in any way, shape, or form, equal rights with men. Women were seen as subordinate, not equal to men. They were actually only even granted Roman citizenship not because they were born as Romans, but only through fathers and husbands. You couldn't have that citizenship on your own as a citizen of Rome. Essentially, their role was basically to have children and stay at home. They, could attend, they, could, they couldn't attend or speak in or vote at political assemblies. They couldn't hold any position of political responsibility at all in the empire. But this was not the case in the church. Do you see how radical what Paul is saying here? There is no barrier in hostility between Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, he says. It's a staggering thought. We take it for granted because we live in a country that's had a Christian history. The church has always been a place where culture and gender, well, they are allowed to be expressed. You know, it's not to say here that actually... Uh, that we have to become identical to each other. That's, that's not what Paul means here when he says there's, that there's no distinctions here. Equality doesn't mean you have to all become a homogenous blob. Yeah? It doesn't mean uniformity. But what this does mean is that because my identity, as we saw earlier, is now primarily above everything else about me, is now in Christ, Son of God, then I am a Christian before I'm anything else, and that means that all barriers that separate people in the world now come down within the church. We meet together in the church as absolute equals, as brothers and sisters. And by the way, church is not just on Sunday. <laughs> yes, yeah, so imagine the implications of this now going out into the world as brothers and sisters, equals together. In the church, there is to be no cultural, class, or gender barriers to our unity together. I mean, can you picture that in ancient Rome? Slaves and masters coming together. Men and women, Jews and non-kosher Greeks, all of them sitting around the Lord's table, serving and ministering to one another as absolute equals. You know Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Imagine even what that is going on there as Jesus washes his disciples' feet. The creator, the king of kings, the ruler of the universe, puts a towel around his waist and washes the feet of human beings, his creatures. A demeaning job. And in the church, that carries through. It doesn't matter who you are. You come equal and serve one another within the church. Every member of the church, you see, is a member, a part of the body of Christ. A body which he is the uniting head. This is what it is to be a Christian. 
Sons of God together, adopted through Christ into his family, granted that wonderful inheritance, becoming an heir, clothed in Christ, identified with him, experiencing his closeness and covered in his righteousness and united together in him in a community of equality. That is what a Christian is. And as we finish thinking about this, it's only possible says the last sentence there, verse 29, because we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Think about that just for a second. Uh, Some of you won't have the context of everything we've been looking at in Genesis. But what it's saying is essentially that is, it is possible that this should be not because of human effort. It's not because of any privilege or heritage that we were born with. Abraham's true seed, his offspring, do not come about by human means. They are children of the promise. The product, as Isaac was, of a miracle. We are the product of a miracle. For a Christian is what they are, not because of anything they themselves bring to the table, but only by the grace of God. That is how we are what we are. And we're going to celebrate that in these baptisms that we have this morning. But before I hand back to Dickie, I'm going to pray for us. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us. You have provided your own son, the preeminent, the firstborn, Jesus Christ, to be our redeemer and our saviour. You have provided him, and he has willingly come to lay down his life on the cross, so that our sins might be paid for, so that we might instead be clothed and covered in his righteousness. Help us now, each one of us, to walk in the newness of the life that he has raised us with, clothed in him, for we ask it in his good name's sake. Amen.